Let's discuss on-site oil analysis solutions for railroad applications. Railroads make up many of the world's uh, transport economy. Uh, there's a lot of uh, systems out there. Um, it's worth, first of all, looking at when we talk about railroad, what do we actually mean? First of all, we're talking about the rolling stock, specifically what's known as the prime mover or the engine, be it diesel electric or electric that's at the front end of either a passenger or a freight train. If we take a, a, a freight train, um, a diesel electric, that gives you an overview of the types of compartments that are lubricated and that need to be routinely monitored. So, in addition to the main engine, also known as the ME or the prime mover, in many applications you've got an electric motor that's supplying power to generators that's driving the, 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 the wheels. Uh, within the wheels themselves, you can have grease bearings, you can have gearboxes or transmissions for traction motor bearings. Uh, you may also have uh, air compressors to keep uh, for brakes uh, control throughout the train. And in passenger applications, you may also have an additional diesel engine, which is designed to provide HEP or head end power, which is essentially lighting and heat for the rest of the train. That's specifically for, uh, for passenger applications. So as you can see on a, on a prime mover, there's many, many different applications that are there. Um, of the world's um, major manufacturers, two in particular stand out. They're both US or US Canada based. Uh, the two major suppliers of engines, especially for diesel electric for freight, are GE and EMD, currently part of Caterpillar. Um, there's a couple of major models. They've been around since the 1940s and there's several thousand of them in existence. GE's famous brands are the FDL engine that supplies the main engine. It's a four to 6,000 horsepower engine. It's been around for many years. Their current engines are the Evo and the next uh, Evo designs. Um, they're generally about 60% of the market for freight applications. And then EMD, which is part of the cat, uh, their major engines have been the 645s, 710s, and then they've got some newer engines up to the 1010J, which is a newer engine that's designed for emissions control and it's the latest generation. Between the two of these, they've got several hundred thousand engines out in the marketplace, both domestically in the US and throughout the world globally. So what are the concerns that uh, fleet managers of locomotives need to be considered? So if we look at that, the major concerns that they have is reliability of those uh, locomotives. Um, and in addition to that, it's uh, the factor is what we call efficiency. And reliability over efficiency is their utilization ratio. Essentially, when is the locomotive ready for duty and can it stay in duty for long periods of time? So everybody d decides to purchase an engine and also maintain it based on those criteria. They're also worried about new engine emission control because of ongoing environmental re requirements. They're also worried about extending the drain interval, especially for the main engine because you've got several hundred gallons of high-grade uh, lubricant involved. And they're also looking at lower consumption rates, both in oil and fuel. So as a result, the engine designs have changed quite dramatically. Railroad oils are quite unique. Um, they're a separate class upon themselves. Even though they're engine oils, they actually have some unique attributes that are not shared with general industrial or general on-highway fleet applications. Traditionally, they are zinc-free, as in there is no ZDDP additive present, and they have traditionally been a monograde, a single weight oil, typically 40 weight. However, nowadays, with all these concerns in play, they are starting to move towards a zinc-free multi-grade design. Um, the main industry uh, uh, body that influences lubricant development is the LMOA, Locomotive Maintenance Officers Association, and they have different generations or loosely based classes of, of oil. And if we look at the three major classes from Gen 5 to Gen 7, which is the latest gen, you can see that it was designed, lubricants have been designed to manage the transition from low sulfur diesel, 500 ppm and, and below, to ultra low sulfur diesel, 15 ppm and below. Why that's important is, is because it has an effect on the TBN that's on the new oil, going from about a 17 brand new to now a 9 base number starting point. 
The viscosity is changing, as we said earlier. It's migrated from a 40 weight single weight to a 40 weight with a lubricity additive to now a new functionality, which is a 20 weight, 40 weight. Multi-grade oils are new to railroad applications. They're now being widely employed with the latest engine design. Um, and they are a little more expensive, but they do help with fuel efficiency. And then what's also important in terms of lower consumption and drain intervals is that traditionally these generation classes, the Federal Railroad Administration in the U.S. would mandate the type of requirement for oil drain interval change. Originally it was every 92 days. Railroads would have to change the oil on their engine by, by decree. And now it's gone to 180 days but it's condition-based, so it encourages you to actually do some on-site condition monitoring to ensure that you can meet that or extend your drain interval based off of that. Why is it zinc-free? Well, traditionally, those EMD 645 and 567 engines that we talked about earlier, which of which there are still many, many thousand in existence, they were a very reliable engine, those use silver wrist pin bushings. And that silver bushings, while they're ideal or excellent lubricity um, and, and when working normally, if you had a, a ZDDP anti-wear additive present that's common in normal uh, on-highway engine oils, that silver bearing would get aggressively corroded with the zinc additive. And as a result of that, the zinc additive was taken out of it. Today, with the current generation of engines, there is no silver wrist pin bushings or silver bearings anymore. Majority of them now are copper bronze. But because many railroads have legacy engines, the industry's response has been have an oil that says one size fits all. So it would not be surprised if you see something known as railroad blue as a definition for a typical type of oil. Um, and even though we don't have silver nowadays, we still have ZDDP or low saps sulfated ash um, specifications for the railroad oils for this application. So what are they, what, with the equipment that's at railroads, let's go over the major types of railroad uh, fleets that are out there, describe the major equipment, the tests that are applicable, and then we'll talk about the solutions. So first is, let's talk about freight or passenger railroads where the following are present. They have older EMD engines, they may have newer tier 4 engines, they have compressors, they may have bogies and truck bearings, or head-end power turbo. Any of those type of applications, particularly where the older EMD must be supported, then of major concerns for, this, for these types of fleets is that they continue to monitor any silver for the engines. They'll want to monitor the zinc because even though the oils are zinc free, they want to make sure that they don't pollute it with any other oil that's coming in, so less than 10 ppm. They want to be watching for water, fuel dilution, and TBN. Many of these engines, in terms of the, from an engine perspective, the big engines don't wear that much. Um, they're usually actually kept on hot standby when they're not operating to keep everything up and running. For the smaller engines, the other wear elements are present. For passenger rail exclusively, and that's certainly a common situation in international requirements, or situations where you've got a fleet which consists of the following. DMUs, which we call diesel multiple units, Yard goats, these are uh, shunting or, or, or locomotives that predominantly stay in a marshalling yard or a switching yard, um, and also a new generation of power blocks type of uh, uh, locomotives. That's where they no longer have a large one main engine, but a series of small engines that turn on and off depending on the power demand. Most of these will have four-stroke engines, compressors, they'll all have APU or hot starts similar to what above. So in those situations, much like here, they're going to have be worried about the typical wear elements that are common in four-stroke applications. They're also worried about coolant leaks. We don't have the coolant issue with the larger engines. It's mostly water-based, whereas coolant and glycol dilution is more common in these four-stroke applications. Fuel dilution is a concern because of a lot of idling water contamination because of the environments that they're working with, ferrous content particularly for the rotating machinery part, and of course soot and total base number retention is very important. For the high-speed passenger trains that are high-speed electric, very common in Europe, now in China, in developing economies, 
That's an interesting one because you do not deal with a large diesel electric engine, but that does not mean that they are not candidates for on-site oil analysis. Instead of having uh, the large diesel uh, motor, uh, main engine, they have electric motor directly pulled from the catenary overhead. But in these situations, they have very complex transmission gearbox applications for to be able to get power to the, bo to the bogies. They have very complicated bogey trucks that have to angle according to high speeds. They've got a lot of air compressors and power supply generators that are on board. And so in those situations, TBN is not a big worry. These are generally long life oils, but they are concerned about wear in major ways, particularly ferrous wear. They're concerned about water and oxidation from picking up on the bogies on the tracks underneath. Total acid number for the long life oils in the compressors. And then they're worried about, of course, sand and dirt ingression. So particle counting and things like that is a big concern. So with those, let's talk about the solutions that would be good so solution. So again, for passenger uh, or freight or passenger based on main engine diesels, okay, you want to be thinking about the Mini Lab series, particularly the engine uh, uh, packages, Mini Lab 143, Mini Lab 123 systems. For the traditional um, passenger rail, that's DMU or a hybrid version, where mostly uh, you're dealing with four-stroke engines. In those situations, the Microlab 40 or the Microlab 43 options are ideal. The Microlab 43 solution gives you that extra ferrous density which you can add to the existing wear elements that are present, and so you have a complete solution. And then for your high-speed rail uh, applications, such as your uh, uh, electric train systems, think of it almost, almost like a high-speed industrial manufacturing on wheels and in that situation Minilab is the best solution for you there because it's got particular focus on particle count, it's got particular focus on ferrous wear analysis and uh, it also has the ability to be able to measure grease as well which is also something they look for from the bogies.